Hey, how's it going, guys? It's me in February in Berrien County, the southwesternmost county of Michigan, and I was at my grandma's house enjoying the diverse and beautiful matrix of ecosystems that once covered and in some places is still existent or integrated into this land. And I had one of the coolest bird watching sessions of my life on this morning because there is such variation in ecosystems here, especially since the advent of agriculture that allows for a diverse matrix of birds. And if you don't think that's the coolest shit, then you can fuck off because look at that great blue heron right there. That was the first bird sighting of the day that I was filming at least. Great blue herons are all up and down this river along with occasionally night herons, but more often green herons. And they like to live in little inlets like that one over there. You see it where the heron's flying to. Little inlets like that where creeks come out and introduce a unique pattern of nutrients into the stream. Yeah. Then, later on, my grandma was making breakfast. It was delicious, as always, and we were watching one of her numerous bird feeders. I must say, Grandma Widmer is one of my greatest inspirations uh, for my love of nature, and her greatest passion is birds. So here, I have seen some of the eastern bluebirds that are pretty common to this area. Before European settlement, they would have probably been mostly an ecotonal species, so they spent their time on the transition zones of ecosystems, on the edges of woods as they butt up against fields, and burnt out forests and such like that. They nest in tree cavities, and because of agriculture, for a while, their numbers actually increased, but then in about the mid-20th century, they precipitously dropped with urbanization because the American dream was just had no room for bluebirds. However, bringing them back from the brink wasn't too hard. When I was a kid, they were still threatened and endangered in some places, but nowadays their numbers are back to normal. You take a look at these guys, uh, you probably wouldn't guess that one of them could hold up to seven eggs and do that multiple times a year, but they do in spring and summer, which is pretty much when they arrive, but these guys were early, weren't they? Okay, so now we got one of my favorites. It's a very common one, the white-breasted nuthatch, pretty much available all throughout the continent. They're really sweet, very vocal, they got a whole damn language of words, and they're monogamous. They raise their young together, equally participating and, you know, hiding seeds in crevices of trees and digging out insects to regurgitate into their children's orifices. Um, and now you see ice flows. It's just... You know, I only had one shot of the nut hitch. Okay, folks, without further ado, the common mergansers coming up here as opposed to the noble merganser. These are common peon mergansers available worldwide anywhere that the water is unfrozen. They live all throughout Lake Michigan in wintertime. I've never seen them more than, more than 13 miles inland, which is where we are right here and also in other places that I have seen them. And they eat invertebrates as, as they do, you know? Um... Yeah, common merganser, fucking hell. <laughs> so now we're approaching the bird feeder to see a northern flicker accompanied by two morning doves. We'll talk about the flicker later. Let's talk about those morning doves. You've seen them before. They're everywhere. They're some of the most reproductively capable birds and probably some of the dumbest. They uh, don't even know how to brush away stuff on the ground to feed from the ground, which is where they mostly feed unless they're eating from a bird feeder. Uh, but they can lay like six to seven broods in a year, so... It's pretty hard to kill them. They're, they're a pretty common species. Now we see the flicker waiting, strangely enough, uh, for these bluebirds to go away. Flickers aren't, you know, totally against uh, feeding in, in mixed flocks with other birds, but I guess the bluebirds are. A cool thing about bluebirds, too, watch them feed when they're actually hunting, because usually they, they eat insects for the most part. They'll eat fruit and seeds, too, but um, the insects they'll just kind of fly down and catch them from around the grass without even without even touching the ground. It's pretty cool. Okay, here comes the coolest part. So that right there, oh, well, there's two swans in the background, and that's a golden eagle. Golden eagle. Oh, yeah, a juvenile one. Now, wait, see that? You see that other thing come out of there? That's a red-tailed hawk attacking it. Red-tailed hawks are one of our most uh, common birds of prey, and... They're also massive. They have a very 
territorial habit, and uh, they do form monogamous pairs and will defend their territory together as a kingdom. And you see that? There's actually two golden eagles. Uh, one of them I saw before here. in the basement, and I had golden to come eagles, upstairs to finish filming it. So these two and they're being probably they're came right from some desert or mountain range out west because that's where they actually breed and live most of the year. But uncommonly, they'll come out east in winter, making the, the journey of their lives, these two. They're, they're coming of age, they're, they're stand-by-me moment, um, where they get attacked by a red-tailed hawk instead of a, a mastiff or whatever. Golden eagles um, do tend to hunt more terrestrial prey, as they often live in areas that don't have a lot of water. So they're not like bald eagles hunting fish and stuff, but the red tails, while also mainly preferring terrestrial prey, are, are, are quite versatile. They, they might just take your dog. These guys can have like a five, six foot wingspan. Look at that. There's a red tail. It's coming in hot. It's like a dog fight, but they're not dogs. They're birds. And by dog fight, for those of you who don't know, they, I'm talking about like, like jet planes and stuff, not, not actual, you know, not, not pit fights. Is it is it messed up that I'm like you know, I'm I'm getting so uh, hyped up about the, watching these animals duke it out? Is that is that fucked up? Nah, it's just beautiful. It's crazy. Look at that. Look at that. Two eagles. <laughs> they can actually get like six to seven and a half feet in wingspan, uh, making them the fifth largest eagle in the world. That's pretty incredible. There he goes, swooping right past those Dude, swans. This is an awesome shot. I'm getting the swans don't give a shit. They are totally chill. This is, this, yeah, yeah, he's I should mention, though, you can't really see him. Um, this is incredible. But there is a duck down there. That's what he's swooping at. This is priceless. Oh, oh and he's on the ice? He landed on the ice? And then this one goes and takes a rest on the ice. So these two guys, uh, or girls, probably came from around the Quebec region of Canada, which is the last place in the east where they do still nest and breed. They have very large territories in their home ranges, too. So out east, you know, they're very adverse to civilization. They don't like ruderal habitats. They need natural geology and vegetation. And so with Quebec being the only place for them to nest, they come down here to Michigan in about November, December, uh, just to kind of hunt and get out of the colder climates to somewhere a little more welcoming. Another neat thing that you can't hear with through the camera audio, I could barely hear it faintly through the glass of the window here, but they were vocalizing. Golden eagles are rather silent birds. I, I'd never heard them make a sound before, except uh, once when one flew real close over my head and I could hear its wings. But these guys were making a uh, pretty loud whistle. Now we shall encounter a shy little bird that was nice to see. Now the Carolina wren. They are inhabitants of forests and woodlands mostly in the just in the eastern part of the United States. But you know, with bird feeders and bird houses, they've found pretty acceptable habitat among people. But they don't really like us. They they stay away from us and most other birds and are rather territorial but you might be lucky enough to hear one of their many beautiful songs. And just, just uh, look at that guy. Oh, he's a little cutie, and he? he's just, he's, oh, oh, look at that. Uh, it was real nice that, uh, it, that this, this little fellow came to visit and wasn't too scared of us through the window drinking our coffee. And as you can see, they are primarily ground foragers and also primarily carnivorous. All right, so right there, Stop. You see some juncos. It's a favorite bird of many bird watchers in the winter time. Ground forager. And up on that feeder is a red-bellied woodpecker. Not a northern flicker. That is a northern flicker right there. So you get a little side-by-side -side comparison. Northern flicker is much larger, has kind of a marbled appearance, and that yellow fringe under the wings, which you're going to see here in a second, that gives it the name northern flicker. There it is. Ooh. And uh, these birds are rather large woodpeckers that primarily forage on the ground. It's actually kind of interesting to see them 
foraging in the trees because I usually see them on the ground digging in the dead logs and in the dirt and mud, shooting their long woodpecker tongue out to grab prey. But here they go, climbing up. Another monogamous bird where both parents contribute equally, probably better parents than most people parents. I, I wouldn't trade my parents for northern flickers, but maybe some of you guys out there can relate. Who knows? And it's worth mentioning, too, that just like uh, some of the other birds we've seen today, like the, the white-breasted nuthatch and the morning dove, northern flickers are okay with foraging in mixed flocks, and they uh, seem to be kind of a defensive mechanism for other birds. You know, they're rather large. Keeps them safe. But anyway... If you'll believe me, I, while I was eating dinner and spending time and having quality conversations with my grandma, okay, I'm sorry I wasn't filming the whole time, but uh, if you'll believe me, we saw 30 different species of birds sitting here in Berrien County on the St. Joseph River without moving more than, you know, 10 feet. That was pretty brilliant. It was an awesome experience, and uh, I really encourage you guys to do some feeder bird watching too because actually a lot of birds are really helped by these feeders who otherwise would not have survived the expansion of civilization throughout the east and uh if so you know thanks for listening to me talk this whole time and if you don't like my my funny voice then you can fucking restart the video and, and turn the volume off and just see the, the pretty birds all right i don't care do what you want to do um I'll be making another video soon about how birds are affected by climate change. And, uh, you know, it's going to use a lot of these this footage as examples. I'm going to really get my money's worth out of this. Not as though I'm getting paid, but uh, maybe I'll throw my Venmo in the description. All right. <laughs>